The sociology of religion is a really broad subfield in, in sociology, and it's one of the subfields that has been sort of part and parcel of the discipline right from the start. And one can talk about it from a variety of angles, such as the, um, the, the um, institutional or organizational structure of religious communities and so on. But what I want to focus on is one um, powerful debate that has been going on in the sociology of religion that maybe kind of structures everything else. Uh, and that has to do with the issue of uh, secularization. At the moment, there is a current discussion going on among sociologists of religion that is called post-secularism, the po kind of post-secular debate or discussion. Uh, and, you know, post-secularism is one of those posts that you find all over the place ever since we started talking about post-industrial society and post-modernism and, and so on and so forth. Post-secularism is almost inevitable. But what exactly are we talking about and, and what are people who are post-secularists reacting or responding to um, w when, they, when they make the claims that they, that they make? And I will say this, there is no one unified position in, ter in, in terms of post-secularism. But I think if we step back and look at um, the history of the sociology of religion, what we'll see, see is that there is a general notion that religion in the modern world is going to wane in significance. It's either going to disappear or probably more likely it's going to become less and less consequential in a variety of ways. And while you can think about Karl Marx, who talked about the opium of the masses, religion being the opium of the masses, he had this dream that it would disappear. Now, he, um, and if you talk about uh, someone like Durkheim, who thought that religion was an important kind of glue that held society together at some level, but he himself didn't seem to be somebody who could embrace religion. Um, but probably the most consequential person in terms of shaping the way we thought about uh, secularization uh, was Max Weber, the great German sociologist born in 1864. Weber's major, if there's one kind of theme that runs through his, his uh, work, I mean, if you look at Marx and you say Marx, is, Marx was primarily interested in two things, alienation and uh, exploitation. Uh, and if you look at Durkheim, you'd say, Probably the theme that runs through his work is solidarity. How does a society kind of hang together? For Weber, it seems to be rationalization. Now, there's no, there's no one, you can't go to any one work of his and say, see, he, he says as much. It's people who have been commenting uh, uh, and doing exegetical studies of his work for decades and decades and decades now have come to the sort of general consensus that rationalization is the kind of thread, the key theme that, that kind of permeates his, his thinking. And, you know, it means a lot of things, but, but among other things, rationalization suggests that we begin to explain and interpret the world in ways other than religious ways, in particular because of, uh, of science, you know, so the, so the tension between, the presumed tension between science and, um, and religion. But this, um, <clears throat> this kind of thinking percolated into sociology as it became a full-fledged discipline. You know, when Weber was writing, sociology was really trying to get grounded. It really didn't have much of a presence in the universities in Europe or North America. I mean, it was there, but it had not been there for a very long time, and it was kind of insecure in terms of its status. But jump ahead to the post-World War II period, which was kind of a high point for sociology, and where, in particular, um, uh, American sociology loomed large, in part because of the devastation of World War II. You know, we ended up being fairly unscathed. And this meant that while Europe was trying to rebuild its everything, including its universities, um, the United States was in a kind of privileged position. There are any number of people who became um, important um, spokespersons or advocates for, for the secularization thesis. Uh, but the person I'll point to, because he was probably the most influential, was a, was a um, person by, by the name of Peter Berger, uh, who uh, argues that 
in fact, you can, if you want to trace the origins of secularization, you can actually go back to uh, the Protestant Reformation. Because Protestantism starts to strip away the kind of corporate and collective character of religion. It, it promotes a kind of individualism. And that means, you know, people are, you know, Martin Luther said you know, uh, in talking about the so-called priesthood of all believers that individuals have a direct relationship with God as opposed to having a church body shaping it, which you, which you found both in Eastern Christianity and in, and in Roman Catholicism. Um, so the seeds of secularization, he said, were planted within religion itself in the West. Okay. And... Not surprisingly, where those places in Western Europe and then spilling over into North America, because they were predominantly Protestant, um, you, you, see, you see in the second half of the 20th century, secularization taking root. Religion becomes a far more private matter. It, it's not that it, or it, sometimes it becomes sort of invisible. It's there, sort of under the surface. But it's not there in terms of shaping people's lives. You don't, you don't uh, decide your career based on what you think God wants you to do. You know, you're not looking for a vocation the way actually Luther talked about. You're not choosing your friends. You're, if you're ill, you're not going to a faith healer or praying to get better. You're going to a doctor and using modern science and technology. In... in um, Place after place, sphere after sphere of everyday life, religion kind of gets squeezed out. Okay? The place that it seems to still have a role is that people end up, and Weber actually understood this. He said people need to understand, they need an account of why suffering takes place in the world. Um, how, do you, how do you explain suffering, which includes the inevitability of death, which is probably, by the way, what I think where Marx got it wrong about religion disappearing in his terms, because he talked about you end exploitation and alienation, but you don't end aging, sickness, and death, you know? And, and so those are the, what, in, in effect, what the secularization thesis thought was that dealing with those ultimate private matters, it, and, then, and then perhaps people um, may find that they can deal with those in ways other than religion. So, the assumption is that some people will become irreligious, a-religious, um, but many, for many people, for most people, in fact, probably, religion will still be part of their lives, but it will it will be compartmentalized. Okay, that's that's what secularization argued. Okay, now compounding all that I just said is something else in the modern world, and that is that we live increasingly in societies, especially the large developed societies that are religiously pluralistic. And one of the ways in which, if you're going to be religiously pluralistic and you learn to get together with people and respect other people's religions, then at some level it becomes a harder sell to say, but my religion is the one true religion. Some people hang on to that, people who we call religious fundamentalists. They want to say, my religion is the one true religion, all other religions are false. But others are prepared to say that, that um, my, this is my way to trying to deal with and wrestle with these issues of ultimate meaning in, in life. But in fact, um, my neighbor who's, you know, you know I'm, if I'm a Protestant, my neighbor who's a Catholic or who's a Jew is doing the same thing. And I respect that. that so at some level then, you don't come away with the same kind of absolute certainty that your religious beliefs are correct. They are more tentative, they are more something that you embrace or endorse, you feel comfortable with them, or you're going to stick with them, you're just going to have faith in them, but, you're, but you also understand that, that there are other options, there are other possibilities. And as pluralistic societies evolve, this means you actually have choices. So you can actually move from one religion to another. You can, be, you, you can be born a Catholic and become a Protestant. You can convert to Judaism, or Jews can convert to Christianity, or, or what have you. And one plausibility structure in all of this is that you're not religious anymore. Now, here's what... One of the, one of the anomalies in all of this debate was that the United States is, 
is still a very religious country. Okay. So how do, how do you explain this thesis if the United States you know, it, it, it is still highly religious? And the argument that Berger suggested was that it's an anomaly. Okay. Jump ahead 20 years, and what you see is a whole lot of evidence that religion in the world writ large is alive and well. You know, uh, in Latin America, not only is Catholicism thriving, now they have it, now a lot of Latin American Catholics are excited because they have a pope from their own region, but evangelical, pro conservative evangelical Protestantism has taken hold and is, is doing all sorts of things. You have, you have both an Islamic revival and an evangelical Christian revival in places like West Africa, like Nigeria. It is true that the, secular, the secularization thesis argued that this was happening in the developed world, and it, and it kind of ignored the world that had not kind of caught up with, with, um, with the developed world. But the reality is you, still fi you find, also find evidence of religion in that world. So what Peter Berger ended up saying is, I used to think that the United States was the anomaly, but now I think Western Europe is the anomaly. The, the lack of religion in Western Europe stands in stark contrast to everywhere else. Okay, so, this is, the, this is the basis for starting to talk about post-secularism. We, we don't live in a secular age. We live in this world in which somehow religion has managed to survive despite it all, despite science, technology, pluralism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's the argument of, of, uh, of um, the post-secularist. They don't necessarily have a, have a particularly, I mean, it's more, in many respects, it's more descriptive Religions everywhere. We can point to it here, here, here. Uh, but in fact, um, one of the things that they raise is the, is the idea that, that um, both religion, various kinds of religion, and non-religion are options. One of, the, one of the realities is people live in a world where you have this sense that they, they have an option. And I'll, uh, I would point to a very, very important article, not by a sociologist, or not an article, a book, a huge book, 700 or 800 page book, by the Canadian um, political philosopher Charles Taylor. And the title is significant because it's called The Secular Age. A number of people who have been talking about post-secularism find this book very, very compelling. And what, what he argues is, in many respects, not quite the way Berger thought it, but we do live in a secular age. People have this, you know, religion is still far more powerful, but, but a secular age is one in which religion is far more of an optional thing and far less something that people are just born into and then stay there. We, 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 I don't know if people still talk about this, but people used to talk in the U.S. about being a so-called cradle Catholic. You know, somebody who hadn't been to Mass for decades and so on will say, I'm a cradle Catholic. Well, that meant you were born a Catholic and somehow you think, I'm still a Catholic even though I'm not a good Catholic or a practicing Catholic, or um, and, uh, increasingly, that kind of that kind of situation doesn't exist. And people, if they're going to be religious, they end up choosing and shifting and moving. And um, and the very fact that you have to make decisions and make choices, and that one of the choices is, is not just among different religious options, but one is to be irreligious. There's now a, an assertive, a, a growing assertive movement, the so-called new atheists who are um, prepared to you know, make their case that, that they need to be seen, and, and sometimes they call themselves humanists, um, sometimes they have a kind of in-your-face attitude towards established religion, other times they're simply saying, we need, to be, we need to have a place at the table here too. But this is the world that we live in. I, would, I, you know, I think sometimes the term post-secular, although interesting, is probably something that leads to more confusion than is necessary and probably the more important thing to think about and look at is that we live in this widely di religiously diverse world and the sheer diversity the sheer pluralism of it is what shapes people's options and choices and so on